today's a really, I think the next step in what I, for me, in, in my uh, time here is a really exciting project because it's not just about one government agency or one organisation going out and doing a project, it's a collaboration. And from everything I'm hearing, it's probably one of those first of many collaborations between yourselves, members, businesses, that are looking for how can we deliver more in the low season without having to close shop. And for many of you who, who run assets that can't be closed or can't be relocated like a bus or an aircraft, so what we're talking about is really key for a big part of the season. The collaboration for me, the way that uh, from a tourism top end perspective, uh, the relationship with Tourism NT and NT major events company by working together and, and with all an agreed outcome. This is all about delivering a great event that will attract more people here to Darwin and to the top end throughout. And I think that's really, you know, it's, it's not just that we're doing another event and it's good for the local. This is key to this is bringing people in. Today's session is a really important part, and there's a series of sessions, and things are moving quickly. Why are things moving quickly? <coughs> because now it's the 6th of June. This thing starts on the 1st of October. We've got to get to market with it. We've got to get our people in our own businesses up to speed. We've got to think about how we can adapt our businesses and how we can put that into distribution channels. It's a whole range of things, and I won't bang on about it. Today we've got two really terrific uh, presenters. Uh, and thanks again to NT Major Events Company, who have invested in bringing people who have some real insight and some lived experience into the type of project we're talking about. So first up today, we will have from uh, Karen Castiglione, and uh, I'm, she's from Distinctly Tourism Management, based in WA. And I'm told because she's from Wyndham, Castiglione, the G is spoken, but her husband being from Italy, it's not from the G, it's not said <laughs> in Italy. But yeah. from Wyndham and WA, there's a G that's important there. So, Karen's going to hit us hard about what were the expectations around Avenue of Honour in Albany? What were the expectations working into it? What were industry doing? What worked its head off and did really well? And where were the things that are probably the opportunities to think about and re recalibrate for next time and do better? So it's a great opportunity for us to get this lived experience there. And then after that, we're going to hear from the wonderful Kathy Burns, who is Director of Arts and Culture at NT Met, and she's going to give us the next level of information about what it is that we're talking about with Tropic Life, what are the installations and background about, what are, what are these? And, and I think a part of it is, Cathy might say to you a couple of times, we'll just keep this in-house, and that's a really important process, because if we give the whole game away, no one's going to jump on a plane or jump in their car and come up here, right? So it's all about getting them here to do that. So without further ado, Karen's going to give us, I'm sure, some really great lived experience, so we can think about what this means for Darwin, what it means for the top end, what it means for our community, and most importantly, what it means for our businesses. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Well, hi, everybody, and thank you very much to the um, NT Major Events team and Tourism NT, Tourism Top End, and, um, and the tourism community for having us here today to have a chat to you about our experiences with Field of Light, Avenue of Honour in Albany. Um, Fair to say that the expectation around this event um, for Albany when it was first put to industry was probably a lot of the same questions that you're asking yourselves. Um, firstly, you know, what if the visitors don't come? Um, and in terms of your investment and your effort and so on, what really, what if it just doesn't work? Um, so no different to a regional location as it, it is for you guys as well. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to report for you that um, not only were those concerns completely mitigated, this event was an outstanding success. Um, one of the things that we spoke to the City of Albany about very early on was about engaging the tourism community and connecting product development, which is desperately needed um, in this region, far less mature as a tourism industry and tourism operators than you guys are. Um, and what we spoke about was that by looking at creative product development, connecting with the authentic story, and creating reach and awareness uh, around the event, that this, this particular event had the uh, potential 
to move the maturing of the local industry ahead at least two to three years. So in, in terms of tourism development, that's a big thing. So we were talking game changer, the, the, uh, the vernacular around the industry locally, as I understand, is, is very similar. So um, lots of parallels to draw between the experience in Albany and what is, uh, what's coming for yourselves. At the end of the day, yep, it's all about driving visitation and it's about understanding your customers. So without further ado, we'll jump into it. So, ah, that works better. Okay, so just a little word about Distinctly Tourism Management. Um, so we are a bespoke tourism development consultancy. So myself and my business partner, Bernard Yule, um, both of us have had at least 30 years experience across a variety of different areas of the industry, um, even though we don't look it, of course. Um, so we have a bespoke team in that we bring our skills around um, particularly destination management. I'll just go back here. Tourism product um, design, strategy and planning with local governments um, and also individual operators, destination marketing companies. Um, in particular, our strength really lies in tourism marketing and distribution. So it's about building capability amongst tourism operators and connecting those operators with the wider industry. Um, it is sometimes I guess a bit of a gap that as individual business owners, we, to, to some extent, particularly in uh, regional areas, that um, we really don't have a great concept of the industry that we're in outside of our own boundary. And when we're talking about who sees and who looks at product, certainly there are cons travel consumers that are always looking directly at you. But 50% of tourism community, uh, consumers are also booking through third party avenues. So that's about OTAs and wholesalers um, and wider tour operators. So that is, uh, is one of the strengths that we bring, which is a bit of a unique um, uh, skill set, I guess. Um, and of course, it's sitting in that very one-on-one -on -one mentoring space. We also have quite an extensive digital team um, and we bring in tourism expertise from other areas as we require it. Um, just a very quick word on some of our recent projects so you understand what that means in context. Um, so we currently run the trade uh, destination management contract for the Amazing South Coast. Uh, the Amazing South Coast is an LTO, so a local tourism organisation, and it covers the region of Albany where uh, the Field of Light was hosted. Um, Optus Stadium, so any AL seen our uh, wonderful new stadium in Perth. Um, very unique project that we worked on there. The state government has given a commitment of a thousand AFL tickets for every match which is held at Optus Stadium. Um, venue operators, they're great at turning on the lights and operating a fantastic stadium, but uh, absolutely no understanding of how to get those tickets into tourism distribution. So that was one of the projects there. Um, we've also taken those products that we've mentored through uh, trade engagement off to ATE, so now connected into international markets. Um, current projects we're looking at the Tourism Product Audit for Destination New South Wales, which covers the lovely Snowies, um, and capability and mentoring programs for both the Tourism Council WA and also the Entrepreneurs Program, which is operating in the Territory as well, uh, through Oz Industry. So we've got quite a, a broad range of projects currently uh, underway. Okay, but we're here to talk about Bruce Munro's amazing light installation in Albany at the Avenue of Honour on Mount Clarence. Pretty mesmerising. So this is um, the, the installation, 16,000 light spheres, all installed um, by volunteers under the, 
the um, management of the Bruce Munro studio. Um, so wonderful community engagement in getting this um, installation up and running. Okay. Where's Albany? All right. Um, so Albany is located four and a half hours drive from Perth. Um, most people experience the region on a self-drive, so three and a half hours from Margaret River, um, three hours from Esperance across from the east, and a 50-minute flight from uh, Perth through to Albany, and we, we have rec services that operate four times a day. So predominantly um, self-driving customers, and our target audience specifically for this project grow more vision out of Perth. So our biggest catchment area out of Perth um, and into Albany. Okay. All right. So the event itself, immersive art installation, um, it operated from the 5th of October through to last year, through to the 28th of April 2019. <coughs> Just to let you know, when we came to the project, um, we were initially uh, consulted to come in on the project around about May. So timing-wise, very, very similar to, um, to the time that we have to be looking at product development and activating um, to the start date that you have for Tropical Light. This installation was at the Albany Heritage Park at Mount Clarence. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as to why it was relevant to this um, installation. But basically it was commissioned to commemorate the centenary uh, anniversary of the armistice of World War I. So federal funding um, had been put into uh, Anzac Albany to commemorate the four years of heritage um, from World War I, so the centenary um, uh, commemorations. And this was the final, um, the final use of that funding and the final event for those commemorations. Um, the illumination was inspired by a carpet of wildflowers. So these are some of the iconic scenes that we see for Western Australia. So directly uh, related to the destination experience but interpreted through illumination and art. Um, colours were inspired by the wildflower colours of Australia and also th uh, of New Zealand. At the beginning, when the piece was commissioned, the projection was that we would receive somewhere in the vicinity of about 40,000 visitors to Albany over a seven month period. So just maybe keep that number in your head um, for the last slide. Clickety clack, let's go. You might need to forward that for me, please, Bernard. Uh, uh, Karen, yes? Press this way, because it's here. <laughs> 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 Good one, Karen. Okay. <laughs> All right. So why Albany? Is everyone familiar with the story of Albany and its connection to Anzac? If you're not, just sort of wave your hand a little bit. Yep. Okay. Oh, thank goodness, because I prepared this slide. Um, all right. So in World War One, um, 1914, um, the, so Australians obviously uh, responded to the call to arms for um, fighting in the war with Britain. So all around the country, troops were amassing um, and signing up and also uh, the same in New Zealand. So from enlisting, troops were marshalled in uh, a whole heap of vessels, whatever vessels could be found and they sailed um, the Australian troops from all around the country and also the New Zealand troops from Littleton in Christchurch, they sailed to meet in Albany in November. 
1914. So 41,000 troops marshalled in the uh, harbour in Albany. The reason being is because Albany has a history as a, a natural um, uh, defence port. There was a British, and still is, a, um, forts that are located at, at Albany, so it was a, a fortified town. Um, from Albany, they sailed in convoy, so 40 plus ships sailed in convoy to the training grounds in Northern Africa and from that Northern Africa into the battlefields in Gallipoli and into Western Europe. So for a number, um, obviously, of those troops, Albany was the last glimpse of Australia um, and certainly the last piece of home. So as a consequence of that um, really rich heritage story, the National Anzac Centre was built in Albany about three years ago. Um, it was opened by the Australian Prime Minister and also the New <laughs> at the time, and uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister, John Key. Um, and it is the only uh, museum of its kind in Australia that specifically commemorates the battles of World War I. So it's a very interactive experience. Um, the reason that people are coming is that in, by and large, um, certainly out of interest in the connection to the Anzac story, which for Australians really is intrinsic in all of us. So there's an emotional connection to that in the first instance, but certainly about researching family as well. So just on the right hand side, um, is the reflection pool and the name of every troop who left Albany is, uh, is captured in, in that reflection pool. So they're researching their family. So that um, rich story was what inspired Bruce Munro to commemorate um, that story through his installation. Okay, so when we came in to the project, we had a, a brief which was pretty simple. Um, create some packages around a field of light experience encouraging length of stay into Albany. Pretty simple, except for just one snag. So the field of light installation was free. So creating a um, tour product for Albany, where there were very few tour operators operating um, and absolutely zero almost um, footprint into wholesale distribution, makes packaging quite tricky because we can certainly talk about um, coming to Albany whilst Field of Light was on and we can talk to operators about building value within their own product. But if we wanted to put a package to market, which was specifically for a field of light experience, it's like saying um, we're going to put a Beyonce package to market, but we don't actually have a ticket for you. So we really needed to be working with the operators to physically create product, which would enhance a visit to a free public art exhibition. So am I drawing parallels? with where you are at the moment. Um, one of the things that we kept very succinct through this whole project was our guiding principles. Um, so we needed to demonstrate value which would enhance their experience, not, um, I guess, detract from what is the experience of a free public art or the integrity around a free public art exhibit. So it's all about enhancing the value for consumers is in the compelling story. So if we're great storytellers, um, that's what engages visitors and that's what will encourage them to pay because your knowledge is more than they could ever research themselves. Okay, so compelling storytelling. The tourism commu community collaboration is absolutely key to this. So working together to share your experiences um, and also add value to uh, where you may be determining that your product experiences some gaps. So it's knowing who does what in the zoo, 
that will add value to your product and to keep the booking process simple. So what we found with Albany was that if we could connect with our um, consumers on that really iconic, emotive, um, compelling storytelling, we could get them to commit um, as, a, as almost like a, an emotional commitment. So you all know about FOMO, fear of missing out. This was a way of being able to indicate to, uh, to visitors that they needed to commit to tour product to learn more in terms of context. Um, we also had two pretty, I guess, big deals um, to encourage tour development. One is about the Anzac Memorial. Um, so right throughout the, the precinct, I'm just going to come to the precinct in a moment. And secondly, that Albany is the uh, first location of the first documented dawn service in Australia. So again, a, a pretty big uh, emotional connection with people that were looking at travelling. Okay. In terms of why this worked, um, some of it is about access. So it is hard to distinguish from a map. I appreciate that. Um, have I got a little pointer? Okay. So Albany is built on two main peaks. Over here is Mount Adelaide, where the National Anzac Centre is located. And up here is Mount Clarence. Both of those peaks have the most sweeping views um, over King George Sound and out to the Southern Ocean. So when we are talking about the story and for visitors to imagine what it must have been like during Anzac times where the vessels were all um, moored in King George Sound, this is where the stories start to make the tour come alive. One of the advantages that we had in being able to build this product was that down here is the um, coach and car parking, obviously, but the Avenue of Honour ran through this area and the lights were installed on either side of this road. This is a public access road, but it was blocked off at this point. All of the Anzac memorials and the location of the dawn service at Padre White Lookout were all located up here. So during the day, these roads were open, but at night time, this road was blocked. So the only way that visitors could engage with those stories was to take a tour. So access is really important. It's important because of perception of value. And what it means is that when you're thinking about product development, you need to be creating that premium experience that needs to be paid for, not that can be experienced by your product at any other time. If that makes sense, access is super important. What, whoops, I'll just go back. What we um, determined in creating the product was about, well, what is, the, what is the sense that the consumer is going to get when they visit Mount Clarence and those locations? One is about the panoramic view across the, um, across the harbour. And the second is about the panorama of descending down this hill and seeing the lights illuminated for the first time. And as a result, we created the Sunset Panorama Tour. So it was about playing with light, um, creating that beautiful sunset view from one of the best locations, and then obviously the beautiful pan panoramic review, uh, view of the lights. So it was a quintessential Albany experience. It made sense to the customer because it was iconic and it was inaccessible other than by a paid tour. This panorama tour became our anchor product 
We priced it um, at a low cost, so it was a low entry for everybody, but we built on top of that. So the, the importance around this is always connecting the authentic story with what the event is about because that's what makes sense to the customer. Along with creating the product, this then became a piece that enabled us to um, bring in local tour operators and collaborate with tour operators to include this product in their own tour program. Um, the same with hotels, that they could purchase and partner with this tour and it was managed through the Albany Visitor Centre. Now the reason that it was managed through the VC was because we needed a central point of booking and if you remember, as I was saying previously, Albany didn't have a footprint really of wholesale trade distribution. So we needed a single booking office that would sit on the site and act as the official booking office for the event. Does that all make sense? Okay. So Sunset Panorama Pass based product, um, we then built on top of that. This is about understanding the customer who is coming at the time of year that they're coming. So we added the National Anzac Centre. We're specifically targeting people out of Perth and new visitors to Albany that had never experienced the Anzac Centre before. But what we know about those passengers is that nine times out of 10 people who come to the attraction come and want to experience more time than they planned for. So in this instance, we understood that that was the, the premise or the, the promise that we needed to deliver to the customer. And we created this product as a 24 hour pass. So it meant that if someone arrived into town later in the afternoon and wanted to go to the Anzac Centre, hadn't left enough time, they then went into the Field of Light uh, exhibit that evening and did the panorama tour and came back to the Anzac Centre the next day. It totally resides in understanding who your customer is, what habits they have, and what they're doing right now, and fulfilling their needs. And of course, because it was a multiple uh, product, it had a savings, so again, a perceived value to the customer. Last, was the light and dine package. So this is really important. Um, this was about saying that we know the vast majority of people coming into the region will be buying at a base level, but there will be plenty of consumers who are making a special effort to come and they will want to make the most of their experience and they'll potentially want a premium experience. This was like the triple whammy, the ultimate way to experience Field of Light. So it included the panorama tour, it included entry to the National Anzac Centre and also a signature dining experience at the garrison located at the Anzac Centre. Um, what we saw by people purchasing this product was that um, they were using it as special occasions, um, Albany operates very much on VFR, as does, as does Darwin, and certainly over the tropical summer. So this was about celebrating and providing friends and family that were coming to visit with an absolute wow experience. Okay, so a little bit different situation in Albany because we had to create owned product and market this through our own channel, so effectively through the Field of Light website. Um, so by creating that um, own product, we were able to be quite nimble to adjust product if we needed to, um, based on our target audience responses or needs. Um, we also were able to look at assessing what do we want to do with this, this product in terms of driving visitors. Now we knew <coughs> for example, that in Albany our need periods were over weekends. 
So we have a lot of corporate business that comes in during the week. Hotels, yes, want, wanted additional business, but actually that really wasn't their gap. Their gap was about driving into the weekends. So the way that we addressed that was to channel the tour product to operate specifically where need products were. So the vast majority of the season, these tours were available from Thursday through to Sunday evenings. Um, the outcome that the City of Albany wanted obviously was to increase visitors into the National Anzac Centre as an owned asset and also to increase revenue into the visitor centre. Um, one of the reasons they want to do that is because that then tips back into destination marketing. The reason we wanted to have the visitor centre very heavily engaged is because it's all about local advice, authentic service. You know your region better than anybody else. Um, so it was, was really important to have them included. Um, what came out of creating owned product around this was the capability building that then happened at the visitor centre. So they installed a new booking system, they installed ResDiv, there's tour operators in the room, you, you may be using that system or a similar one yourself, <coughs> excuse me, that created direct uh, booking links on the event website. The training of the team was probably the biggest outcome that came out of this um, and understanding their role as being the official booking centre for Field of Light, being very revenue focused, not only selling these particular tours, but recommending additional stays, additional tour products as well. So we, we ended up with a, a significant um, mindset change and uh, the training of a booking officer to build regional itineraries as well. So remember, you guys know your region better than anybody else and your local advice, um, tips and tricks are more important to a consumer than the, the simple booking of the mechanics of a package. Okay. So as a result of that, um, we not only channeled the tour products out through the website, but we also then connected them into uh, distribution partners. So remember I said to you that when we look at a marketing strategy as an umbrella over a business, we run a line up the middle, 50% of consumers are looking directly at you for all the, the efforts that you make in directing traffic to your owned channels. The other 50% are booking through anybody who isn't you. So that could be a visitor centre, it could be an OTA, it could be a wholesaler, it could be accessing your product through a coach tour operator. So really important that we took these products to those partners to create more and more reach and more and more destination uh, information. We were able to uh, get that into Qantas Holidays, which was fantastic, um, obviously also into the Hollow World Network, and then to connect um, international tour operators as well. So this is just one of the examples from uh, Wing On in Hong Kong. Um, in addition to having that product as an anchor around the event, we were then able to look at activating, well, how else do we partner the product with what else is going on in the community? This is just um, one example. So we had a um, WA Opera event in the treetop walk, completely unique to the region, a one-off event. But what we did with it was to work with the VC and uh, could also have worked with a, um, a wholesale partnership, but bearing in mind that just wasn't the environment for Albany. But we wanted to create not only the unique event around the, 
the opera, but how can we leverage um, Field of Light as well? And how can we extend length of stay and push this into Perth, our target market? So we created an aria and lights package, um, including three nights accommodation at a variety of Albany properties, ticket to the opera, um, a beautiful winery gourmet picnic hamper, and transfers in and out of Albany as well with a sunset panorama experience tour. This event was held about an hour and a half west of Albany. So it's about understanding, okay, well, we know that people are going to be motivated for Field of Light, but what about if they also were able to get that double whammy? So I'm really interested in other experiences and hey, it's a great time to head down there and let's make the decision because we can also see Field of Light. So think about how that could connect with other events that are scheduled, not necessarily in Darwin, but how can we feed out and, uh, and leverage this event for regional properties as well. Uh, yes, it's sold out in five days and all out of Perth, which was our um, target audience. It then allowed us to also create um, new campaigns. This is just a, a press ad um, which went to market, but again, it was pitching directly into Perth and talking to some of the barriers that we, um, we knew uh, for that particular market. So um, Perth people, very similarly, um, we don't necessarily want to drive 15 minutes down the road from our own little suburban haven, let alone drive four and a half hours down the road to Albany. So we positioned this as world-class uh, art or world-renowned art is closer than you think. Um, so again, aiming for extended length of stay, so positioning three nights, the tour, entrance into the NAC, and a signature dining experience. So this was um, at a, uh, an, an iconic pub um, which overlooks Middleton Beach. Again, this is about understanding the customer. So give the customer what they already know, what they already want to experience, because when we can bundle it in a package, they've already assessed the value for themselves <coughs> and channeled through the, uh, through the booking centre. Okay, what worked? Well, destination awareness through storytelling was phenomenal. Um, the media value that was achieved through partnerships with the event managers um, and Tourism Western Australia has been estimated at about 5.5 million, so which was fantastic. 40,000 visitors was our projection and we ended up with 200, approximately 200,000 visitors. So you can imagine that every hotel in Albany was tickled pink. Tour operators were happy as clams. Um, but importantly, the long tail of this, the ongoing, is what we wanted to achieve for Albany as a destination. So we wanted to tell the market that Albany is a place of Anzac pilgrimage. Um, and we achieved it. So we now have, as we started to progress through the event, outside of the Perth market, we then started to see uh, new markets starting to engage. That was achieved through clearly PR around the event. Um, but also through opening up new markets with trade distribution. So we've just got a lovely um, comment there from some New Zealand uh, visitors who were in Albany specifically for Anzac Day. So tick the box. Fantastic. Okay. Um, sales data. So specifically from the tours themselves. This is irrelevant, uh, irrespective of the, the volume of um, passengers that came in. Oh, am I there? Have I shut it off? 
fix it, burn it. <laughs> Gosh, I'm such a beginner. Got it? Oh, I've gone too far now. Oh, God, it saw the wheels are falling off. Okay, so sales data specifically from the tours. Um, $185,000 plus gross revenue specifically from the sale of those tour products. But the big win was about what else did this mean for tour products, sales and recommendations. So the visit, remember the visitor centre was the, the sole um, official booking office. But the visitor centre sales, because of um, education that was done about revenue generation, but tourism community recommending other products, being aware of what those products were, matching complementary planning itineraries, everything that fell out of that education piece. Um, 1.6 million in gross turnover for the visitor centre for October to April whilst the event was on compared to the previous year was $390,000. Significant return and you don't reckon the city of Albany were happy. Holy cow. Okay, but just interestingly, if you just have a look at when the visitors arrived. So from October, when the event started, 8% of visitors in October. Lots of pre-promotion, um, but you know, it still took that media activity from when the event was in situ to really start driving um, arrivals. However, it's so, so important. So if we talk about what we learned out of this, so, so important to get that early messaging out. Um, and then we saw growth continuing from there. Interestingly, into November, 14%, 15% in February. That's because the market was about mature people travelling. Over December, and January, sales went down because at that time, that's families travelling for Christmas holidays and mature travellers are not necessarily going to want to go and stay in a caravan park full of screaming kids um, and they were educated about when to come. So as a result, we then saw a complete spike in activity right the way through to the end of the event. February, for Albany, all the way through to Anzac Day, is traditionally a slide on visitation. So the, the result of this event specifically addressed um, driving visitation in at need times. 33% of sales went to that base low cost product. But importantly, we saw upsell right the way through. We also engaged cruise market. We had specific member offers for um, uh, uh, RAC, which is the equivalent here. Of, you have a, an automobile. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what is it? Thank you, yeah. So equivalent organisation, mature members, trusted brand, um, completely on target with what we were pushing into market. Okay, accommodation. Um, we had local accommodation um, partners buying in to promoting the event. Really importantly that they created their own web page specifically with event information. And what that does is obviously creates a search footprint online as well. So if anyone was searching for accommodation in Albany, at the time of Field of Light, these packages were also popping up. That was about the accommodation partners creating their own value add. And for some of them, this, this particular partner um, was also about giving them access to purchase the tour products. So we had them set up as resident agents and they were able to sell actively the product for their guests as well. So servicing levels just went to a, another level. Um, but it's all about addressing the customer's needs.
Um, local collaborations with operators. So this little package, um, Busy Blue Bus, is the biggest show in town in terms of tour operator. Um, number of, of different tour products that they, um, they do and they were also procured as the transport operator to run the, the field of light sunset panorama tour. They partnered with Best Western um, to package a three night stay, including their tour plus a sunset panorama tour as a value add. So again, we were targeting collaboration amongst the community, created a wonderful web page about it, um, and then also adding value with the, uh, with the Sunset Panorama Tour. This package um, was out particularly early. So what I would say to you is that we want to create that online footprint. Don't be frightened as a tour operator or as an accommodation partner to start talking about this. So start thinking about what you can bundle um, for your guests, you know who they are coming, hopefully you know who they are coming over the tropical summer and what their needs might be or what your unique point of difference is. Think about bundling it and get it out early. Let's start getting some blog posts out from each of the operators as well because that is what um, creates expectation for the market. Okay, lessons learned. Well, the event sell-through is absolutely critical to the, to the success. And what I mean by that is, this isn't an event that's here for two days. This is an event that is here for six months. Six months? Six months. Okay, so we've got time to educate the market that it's coming. We've got time that when we put a product in market, if it needs to be tweaked once the event is in situ, we've got time to do that. So you saw from the arrivals from Albany, big upswing um, towards the end of the event because all of that wonderful activity had already happened. Know your target audience profile, so I've spoken about that quite a lot. Families, 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 yes, they will come in droves. We didn't experience that they necessarily paid, um, but if you're a restaurateur or um, a, an attraction that's specifically targeting families for other activity, leverage the Tropical Light event in all of your communications. Um, Enhancing the free event through premium access experiences. So make sure that your customer can't necessarily experience what you're putting to market or can't access your knowledge or can't see um, a, a particular installation or some other way that you're adding value to a free event. Um, one of the things which would have made quite a big difference for us um, in terms of the sales, and we we're already happy with them, but would have made a big difference, um, is having mobile booking processes in place to be selling on site. So what we found is because there was more activity and people were arriving into town uncommitted, they were seeing the tours, seeing the activity of other people, hearing things around town and making a snap decision to go. And we weren't capable of being able to capture those people on site. So, and that's at the installation. So if you think about hop on, hop off buses or uh, walking tours where someone might want to join midway through or all, all of those sorts of things, and we can talk about them in the uh, next sessions having that ability to capture them straight away uh, will increase your sales. Go to market early, um, as we've discussed, and always, 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 always tell the story.
Anybody, anybody went to Alb Albany, saw it, experienced it? What did you think of it? Oh, I liked it. It was very interesting. Beautiful place. Um, a bit cold compared to Paris, but it's <laughs> And easy to book? Easy to get there? I went there for a, a triathlon, so it was easy for me at that time. I was with friends, so we went around. A beautiful place, a lot of history over there. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, it was, uh, it was very nice. It was about seven years ago, so, but yeah. Questions? Lynn Jackson's always got a question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no sorries. Hello. Hi. Hi. And I'm not asking for it to come out to lead point, I promise. <laughs> uh, just, uh, just looking at that, a lot of it was built about, obviously, the, the heartstrings thing with the Anzac thing. Um, as far as I know, we don't kind of have that with this. Was that a major component, do you think, in the success? Yeah, I think any story storytelling brings the event alive. So one of the things we've been exploring and we uh, did our first walkthrough of the locations today um, is about finding that connection between what the installations are and what the experience of the region is. And it's really important that we, we find that uh, connecting theme um, because the message to market um, for the tropical summer for Darwin is about come to Darwin at a different time of year, find um, a completely different experience, see Darwin in a new light um, and playing on that, that wordplay. But for me walking around today um, was about rejuvenation, um, regeneration, creating new urban spaces, um, telling the market that the tropical summer is a vibrant time to, to be here. Um, we were here, so I uh, brought my family up in January last year for 10 days. And one of the reasons that we wanted to come at that time of year it was because of the, um, the drama of the season. So I think um, as Southerners, you know, if we come up at that time of year, I was saying to the guys this morning, you know, if we, we come up, we're constantly looking at the sky, I think, God, will we see him, you know, will we see lightning and all of that sort of stuff. And it's very exciting. It doesn't need to be a barrier. Um, and I think with the plans around connecting urban spaces and the vitality that um, is being planned and talking about regeneration and this, you know, what does the season do at that time of year? The, the landscape regenerates. That's the connection that we, um, we need to make. So this is a, a hugely exciting um, opportunity for, for Darwin to be able to switch some of those, switch some of those perceptions and, um, and create a really vibrant story around it. So we can find the story in the story. Strong packaging is obviously going to be amazing. Strong, strong um, packaging and narrative is going to be really key to this. So it's about talking about the destination and then finding where the, where the installations sit um, within that. But there's you know, some really exciting stories that we can start to tell. Dave's got a question. Hi. Hi. Um, I may have missed this, but the Avenue of Light, is it continuing indefinitely or has it, has it stopped? <laughs> it's a really good question. The <coughs> Avenue of Honour um, is not continuing, so the, um, the city did try to have those conversations with the Bruce Munro studio about um, re-engaging for next year. The story and the motivation around that piece was specifically around the centenary um, uh, commemorations. So the challenge for Albany now is, you know, what comes next? Because we, um, we know that we've positioned this story of pilgrimage, so we now need to capitalise on heritage pilgrimage year on year and look for the next um, event opportunity. So continuity and consistency 
for the market is hugely important and we see that with um, Vivid, for example, that is now um, repeated. I think we're organised probably in the sixth or seventh year of, of Vivid um, and it's driving huge visitation in but the market is now educated that this is one of the most vibrant times to go to Sydney and this is the opportunity for Darwin as well. So if we're talking about tropical summer, what's the experience in tropical summer? Well, it's vibrancy, it's regeneration, it's colour, it's drama, it's activated urban spaces um, and loads going on. More going on than you would even think. So that's the opportunity to keep this consistency here on the it's really important. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, you mentioned about uh, when you were talking about the opera combination package, you mentioned about the arts, and now you've just mentioned with Albany about the heritage part of where you see Albany going forward. To what extent did you find and would you expect to find arts being important for Albany? And also, do you see that as a potential angle for us here in Darwin? Um, art is always important um, in connecting communities. It resides at the, you know, the essence of who we are. Um, as a local community in uh, Albany, I'll speak to, to that for the first instance, um, there is a very, very strong um, arts community. Um, Denmark, which is half an hour west of um, Albany, is effectively a, a artisan community, if you like. So, and also because of the demographic in Albany. Um, so, so yes, arts and heritage is a, um, a real core of, of the experience. Um, I guess arts, in terms of that vibrancy, is what adds value to a, a visitor's stay. So um, sometimes visitors will be drawn because there's a specific art event and others will be about, okay, well, we've, we've come for other reasons, but there is so much more going on here and we've got this whole sense of vibrancy. Um, so in looking at um, some of the locations today and bearing in mind that it's the first time we've seen the, the proposal and I don't want to steal the um, thunder of um, Cathy's presentation, but um, urban spaces and culture is um, for me going to be quite key to this. So when I'm talking about rejuvenation, regeneration uh, of energy in urban spaces, it's certainly very visible from some of the, the trails that we walked around today. So yes, I, I see it as a, um, a real key for the CBD component in particular of this event. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. And more around the arts, and I think that's great. I see that that opera night, and I, I see things like a, a Germanic uh, opera night headed up by Marcus, and there'll be a Bushwhackers band night there by Ted. And we've got Dave with his mariachi band, and we've got Melanie with her K-pop girls group. So we've got a whole range of events. Holy cow! <laughs> um, so thank you for that. I, there's a few things that were, I think were really cool takeaways in that an initial expectation of forty thousand. And to get a five-fold increase in 200,000, and that's the ones that were able to be tracked, that's a pretty awesome number. From Visitor Information Centre perspective, which you know that I stand here at that reception, if I can turn $390,000 of business which goes directly to you into a 425% increase, that's going to be a pretty good thing as well. Uh, I, I really like the long tail outcome of that because this is not just about creating an event just for this period. It is about changing how the world thinks about what we used to call the wet. And now we call the tropical summer. So I think there's some really powerful stuff there. Thank you very much. And for me, the keys were, and I, I loved it, Karen, identify the market, uh, the need periods, package, think about the distribution, and then look at the value adds. You know, notice I didn't hear any of that presentation which says, where's your discounts? I heard value adds. I thought that's really important. Um, I, um, and so there are a whole range of areas where we can get involved. Clearly, 
some of our, 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 our beloved operators, Jim from Segways, John from Walk Darwin, will be able to provide some really great functional product, packageable product. But it doesn't mean that, Gary, with, with advance, that you're not including this in your promotion, your online, your activities, because people still need to pick up an air, a car and get from the airport and get to A to B. It's not just about what they do on the night. So it's how we package around that. And of course, the accommodation providers, from a retail perspective, and I'm not going to bite in that, but I went to a fantastic presentation by Cathy the other night, and Joe Smallcom was uh, there. If you uh, don't know Joe, uh, Department Chief Ministers, they're putting forward a match dollar for dollar, 500 grand for window theming. So take some elements which will become available and put that into the window so De Croco can take on a very elegant connection <coughs> with what's happening. And we can do that in our, in our tour desk, in our hotels. Gee, I'm thinking what we can do with the Visitor Information Centre in terms of making that a bit of a, a signpost that goes, but not to interfere and not to match. So without any other questions, I think this is really exciting. As you know, many of you have already registered for some workshops this afternoon um, and, and tomorrow morning. They're, they're sold out. We, this presentation, thank you, Karen, and thank you, uh, Bernard, we, uh, will be made available and distributed, so we have your emails. That will be sent out to you. Uh, I would now like to hand over to Cathy Byrne. So Cathy did a smashing presentation to the Retailers Association the other night and opened the retail sector as to how they can engage, because it wasn't so obvious for them. It's much more obvious for us in this room. So I really look forward to her thoughts. And these are idea starters. I would preface it this. This is not, you must do this, this, this. This is just some great content and ideas uh, around what we can be doing and also some more information around the installations. Would you like the microphone? I uh, know. <coughs> if I can have someone to um, make this work. Yeah, I've changed the source. <laughs> I've changed the source. It's in there. But, uh, no, on the projector. I don't know where the switch is. Oh, can you change it to an RGB, is that right? Yeah. yeah. I've got old school. RGB might be under R, I guess. <clears throat> so while they're doing that, firstly, my name is Cathy Burns. I work as the Director of Arts and Culture for the Northern Territory Major Events Company, who are delivering this event. And I'm the person leading the delivery of Bruce Munro Tropical Light. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the land which we gather today, our Larrakee Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and rising. So I've got a 15 minute presentation today which is to talk specifically about the eight illuminated sculptures and tell you the story of how Bruce came to these sculptures and also then their links in with Darwin. Um, there also will be, um, by this afternoon, anyone who's registered for their tourism drop box already, there's new content in there, including the stories. Plus, in that drop box is a whole bunch of actual hard assets for you. So that's pamphlets that we've designed already. So all you have to do is print them out. Things to go on your Facebook banners, just pop them up there. So that way then it's already done, we've approved it all. Just don't change it, just pop it up there. There are coasters in there, there are placemats in there. For the hotels, there's a door handle, signs you can stick on your door. So we've gone, we've got window decals that says book your tropical light tour here. There's the A3, A3 framing standing out the front. So we've got all that. All you have to do is go and get them printed. So that are all in your Dropbox. By tomorrow, you'll have it all there ready for you. Oi, Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Bruce Munro, Tropical Light. It is a ma new major event for our tropical summer, featuring the work of world-renowned artist Bruce Munro. Bruce takes inspiration from place and time and expresses these themes through large-scale installations and sculptures of light. In Australia, Bruce has created Field of Light, an installation for Uluru, and he then also placed Field of Light at the Avenue of Honour in Albany, Western Australia. The installation Field of Light is made up of thousands of optic fibres spread across a large space. Though Bruce Munro has designed something very different for Darwin. Tropical Light features eight illuminated sculptures that will be installed in public spaces across the city business district of Darwin. Tropical Light is Bruce Munro's only citywide exhibition in the world. The scale of this exhibition is really important to recognise in understanding the impact it will have on the viewers 
and that it's able to connect in with every business within that vicinity. These sculptures will capture our imagination, inspiring interest during the day. They hold their special significance when illuminated at night. The sculptures will be illuminated from 7 p.m. and will remain switched on until 10.30 p.m. every night of the week for the six months. There will be illuminated signage at each of the sculpture locations for viewers to learn the stories about the exhibition and the stories behind the works. These eight illuminated sculptures are a collection of new and existing works by Bruce Munro and all link in with Darwin in either through flora, fauna, weather or lifestyle. Two of the works are having their world premiere, having been designed specifically for Darwin. Bruce says, it's a privilege to be given the opportunity to create an exhibition for Darwin. This cosmopolitan city has changed a great deal since my last visit in January 1992. Darwin is a jewel that modestly sparkles under a tropical sun. It has much to offer the discerning traveler in one of the most remotest parts of the globe. The theme of the exhibition is uniquely all about Darwin. On my recent visit in July, I was lucky enough to witness and truly absorb its natural beauty, unique wildlife, welcoming locals and glorious sunsets. All of these incredible experiences both captivated and inspired me to create the exhibition and it will be a great honour to bring it to fruition. So looking at the map, I'll take you through each sculpture starting at Civic Park, conveniently located near the bus terminal for easy drop off. Gathering of the clans, Bruce says, while living in Australia, Serena, my girlfriend, now wife, and I moved from Paddington an inner city suburb of Sydney, 40 kilometres north to the beautiful seaside suburb of Palm Beach. Our house was located above the beaches, surrounded by a sprawling wood of gum trees. Every morning, we were greeted by the raucous bird calls of the Australian bush. The species that delighted me the most were the cockatoos, especially the sulphur-crested cockatoo, whose snow-white plumage, sunny crown and rhadamanthine disposition was in complete contrast to its vocal outbursts. <coughs> the screeching cry that emanated from its bill was particularly cruel after one too many beers the night before. Nevertheless, I often find myself reminiscing about these less than romantic moments of living experience in Australia with great nostalgia. My sketchbooks are full of disparate jottings and sketches and for some odd reason, a number of random thoughts and observations happen to align in my mind like a celestial eclipse. The physical form of Gathering of the Clans is inspired by an eclectic mix of Australian cockatoos, the sound, washing lines, our iconic hills hoist, and the work that kept me employed experimenting with fluorescent acrylics that glowed when irradiated with ultraviolet light. Rather like the anthropomorphic animal heroes of Narnia, I saw similarities between the Australian cockatoos and our Scottish brethren. They both can be distinguished by flamboyant markings, kilts versus exotic plumage, and speak in a dialect that's difficult to decipher, particularly when they come together for a corroboree or a cadage. The installation aims to capture the essence of these exotic birds. The bird form has been abstracted and color coded into an array of fluorescent clothes pegs. Each species will be perched on a rotary washing line, united in sound, Gathering of the Clans is a veritable gathering of psychedelic sound and illuminated colour. So as you walk through the exhibition, there will be the audio of all those raucous birds going around. Next, we head to Rain Tree Park for Pukulima, which is otherwise known as the temperature clock. Bruce says, one of the joys of traveling is that I tend to be in a more receptive frame of mind to receive new ideas. Whilst visiting Darwin, I was asked to consider Raintree Park as a possible location for an installation. On researching the rain tree, I learned that it has an unusual quirk of folding its leaves either when it rains or at dusk. In Malay, the tree is known as the Pukalima or the five o'clock tree. The installation is a visual development of this fact. Simply said, the installation acknowledges the tree that inspired it. The hours are represented by 12 ceramic vases, which are in turn inspired by the North American Indians of the Sonoran Desert. These people invented, many eons ago, an ingenious air conditioning unit from a perforated earthenware ceramic jar, raised off the ground in a cradle made from a crook of a tree branch 
with a reservoir of water in the base. They had discovered that the fast evaporation process that takes place in a dry desert climate creates a cooling effect. In 1998, Bruce created a sculpture called Iceberg. The sculpture was created for a Caribbean home and consisted of a hand-blown glass bowl complete with a cluster of illuminated ice blue sandblasted and acid polished glass. The effect was something akin to a cold version of a coal fire. At the time, he noticed that people tended to congregate around the piece because it made them feel cooler. Pukulima, therefore, is an amalgam of all these ideas. The aim is to literally create a chilled out timepiece for people to meet and converse in Rain Tree Park. Now we head down West Lane and go to Bennett Park. So we capture all the street art along Austin Lane and West Lane and we go to see Telegraph Rose. Telegraph Rose is one of the works having its world premiere. Many installations are an eclectic mix of facts, feelings and ideas, says Bruce, that he collects magpie fashion from his travels. He says the concept of an artwork often evolves from these fleeting visits. Telegraph Rose is an example of this process. Whilst in Darwin, I gleaned from a local historian that the first international Morse code message was sent by Telegraph just below the lawns of the Parliament Building in downtown Darwin, right next to Bennett Park. And during a helicopter flight, he learnt that the good folk from the Northern Territories are enthusiastic about fishing. I also discovered that the Territory had its own flag. The fly of the Northern Territory flag is a stylized dirt's desert rose, the Territory's floral emblem since 1961, with seven white petals and a black seven-pointed core, the seven white petals represent the six Australian states and the Northern Territory. Telegraph Rose is an installation of 700 vertically orientated fishing rods laid out in the form of the Sturt's Desert Rose, the Territory's floral emblem. The first international Morse Coast mes message is featured in the audio element of this work. The message reads, we have this day, within two years, completed a line of communication 2,000 miles long through the very centre of Australia, until a few years ago, a terra incognita believed to be a desert. Moving on to the old town hall ruins for the elusive green flash. Bruce says, for years now I have been experimenting with fibre optics. Over that time, I have developed numerous different types of artworks that use it some inspired by form, some as a response to a physical space, and others as an expression of feeling. My enthusiasm and love of creating site-specific works was rekindled during my visit to Darwin. My work is in part a natural development in process, materials and structure. Green Flash is an amalgam of all three, a monumental geodesic sphere from which will radiate 1828 carbonated water bottles. Each bottle will be illuminated by a single fibre optic cable. Green flashes and green rays are optical phenomena that sometimes occurs right after sunset or right before sunrise. They occur because the atmosphere can cause the light from the sun to separate out into different colours. When the conditions are right, a green spot is visible above the upper rim of the disk of the sun. The green appearance usually lasts for no more than a second or two, sometimes rarely the green flash can resemble a green ray shooting up from the sunset or sunrise a point. The green flash has been one of those naturally occurring, occurring phenomena similar to the Aurelia Borealis that captured my attention and imagination as a child. Later, whilst living in Australia in my 20s, I spent many memorable sunsets and occasional sunrises attempting to capture the elusive green flash with my camera. At dawn and dusk, 1,820 illuminated bottles slowly morph through an array of colours of a rising and setting sun, momentarily flashing hues of green. So you'll have to be there at the right time to see it. So as we move from the city and make our way to the waterfront, we will walk past a photographic exhibition from Louise Denton along Smith Street. This is part of Tropical Light featuring Darwin artists, and each of the pictures have been inspired by Bruce's sculptures. They tell a little bit more and I've been flashing some of them up during this presentation. At the Palm Grove lawns at the waterfront, we have Time and Again. Time and Again is a continuation of a theme of work that Bruce began with CDC in 2010. CDC consisted of a sea of 600,000 CDs laid out onto a field at Long Knoll, 
his home in Wiltshire. The inspiration, a timeless moment, dates back to the mid 80s when he lived in Sydney. I was young, far from my family, and I often spent time watching the water. Through it, I felt a connection with my home and family in Salcombe, a place also on the water. In spring of 2016, I had the opportunity to realise a dream project, namely to create Field of Light at Uluru in Central Australia. My visits to Uluru inspired many new thoughts about the passage of time, and that in turn inspired an installation created for Sotheby's Beyond Limits exhibition at Chatsworth House in October that year. Time and again follows my interest in time and how we move through it. It is a work in progress, an amalgam of the time-based installations that he has created to date. The idea of using a lily format again as a visual reference was inspired from a visit to Chatsworth House, namely the large canal adjacent to the house, as well as its tradition of growing giant Victorian lilies in the iconic glass houses. The resulting visual format is simple and to the point. 37 stainless steel lilies form a convex dome, each lily representing past, present and future timepieces. By day, the installation lies dormant, quietly marking time with the clouds and sky. By night, the central hub of each lily shimmers with radial bursts of starlight. The iteration of time and again in Darwin takes the form of a mythical timepiece, representing the past, present and future as one eternal timeless moment. Sun Lily on the Peninsula Lawns is, having, is the second work having its world premiere. This artwork is composed uniquely for Darwin, but based on a form first developed by Munro in 2008, a sprig comprised of points of light which he grouped into installations called fireflies. Whilst in Darwin, Munro came across the spider lily, which bore a resemblance to the firefly form. He thought it would be a fitting tribute to arrange his art artwork as inspired by that beautiful tropical Australian flower. Up to 400 fireflies will form the shape of a beautiful flower soaking up the tropical summer called sun lily. It will span 14 metres in diameter. Then we'll take a walk past the precinct to the canopies around the wave lagoon to see the stunning light shower. Bruce says, in 2008, I was invited to propose some alternative lighting designs for a contemporary Highland Lodge at the head of Loch Ossian in Scotland. I found myself sitting on a step halfway up the main stairs of the lodge, absorbing a magnificent, uninterrupted view of the loch and a group of snow-capped mountains beyond it. It was raining in squalls against the plate glass window, which disordered the view with rivulets of water streaming down the panoramic pane. The words light and shower registered in my mind and I had an idea. The original installation now hangs motionless as if suspended in time, overlooking but not interrupting the view of the Loch Ossian. By day, it catches glimpses of the sunshine, shedding prismatic flecks of light onto the stairs. By night, it morphs into what is a shower of light. My version of light shower for Darwin is an exterior iteration of the installation. Simply said, it is a sculpture celebration of the wet season in the Northern Territories. So there are three canopies around the wave lagoons and they will run along all three. And then we end our path on tropical light along the Darwin seawall for water towers. When Munro was 21 years old, he read a book called Gifts of the Unknown Things by Lyle Watson. In it, the author describes a young girl who possesses the gift of seeing sounds in color called synesthesia. The idea inspired water towers. In Australia, the iconic water tower can be seen in almost every remote outback town. Each of Bruce Munro's water towers is made of stacked carbonated water bottles illuminated by optical fiber light, like enormous liquid batteries of light. 30 water towers will run along the sea wall, creating a stunning view for all to see via the sea or land whilst enjoying an evening at the waterfront. So that is tropical light. As you can see, it's not the installation field of light. It is an exhibition featuring eight illuminated sculptures that spread across the Darwin CBD. So all of these approved sculptures, all the stories um, are in the Dropbox for you to be able to use. I have now permission that the stories that I have provided you are not, they don't have to be treated as confidential. They are stories, they are what's gonna be on the exhibition signage so we can keep a consistent messaging. I just ask though, don't 
printed on your website now, but you can actually have them ready for your tool packages. So you might have the stories in a pamphlet that you walk around. Um, we'll start posting some on our website. I suppose leave that part for us. But yes, yeah, start to get the content ready for what you need it. Any questions about the stories? I know that some of you feel that, uh, gee, that's a bit interesting. And others kind of go, oh, gee, I love that piece. And I think there's a lot of conversation that we can have around is that right or not. But to me, the opportunity is moving forward is to get the understanding of what's there. But we get, get the understanding of how can I fit this into my business. I also um, love the way that, that Cathy's had erudibly presented that, just the stories and the sense of what that is. And it's bigger than just Darwin too, which is kind of nice, right? It's bringing in some stories from all around the world on that. Any questions? And just to add on to that, um, the conversations that I've had with Bruce about his work, community is at the heart of everything he does. He has no qualms at all with people looking at his work and finding their own story to tell. That's part of his process and his work is that people might find their own interpretation from something. They might look at one of the installations and go, oh, that looks like XXX and take their own version of the story. He's got no qualms with you creating your own <laughs> linkages to each of these pieces as well. And also, look, what, what I heard, so a couple of takeaways I got, eight, eight key sculptures. But those sculptures are also designated to be able to create some opportunities that we go past some of the wonderful murals we've got here in the city and some of the aspects that we already have in the city and that we can embrace and make it so much more for that journey for people that are getting around. So it's, it's great. I, I feel probably this is the start of the journey. This is where it starts with, with yourselves who have taken the time to get involved and find out more and how this then proliferates is how we talk to our people, we talk to our people in our businesses, our friends, our family, associates, people in to stay, starting to build that momentum and, and share those stories. And, uh, and I, I, did, I reflect on the Uluru piece in there. I was in China when that was released. And it was not the government coming up to tell me about it. It was voyages. It was voyages coming out and, and locking down the wholesalers, the retailers, working with the media outlets, driving it through their social media channels. They were the ones that owning it and running that out. And as a result, with a combination of that and the end of uh, Uluru climbing, they're seeing a high 90% occupancies for all these months and doing exceptionally well at an amazing rate. So it's about that ownership from industry, which I think was really important there. Um, and of course, the real practical outcomes, I think, which, which Kathy's been working so hard on in thinking about more than just to be able to give you a really elegant description of what they are, but how we can deliver that in some really simple senses, which is great. So any questions? I've rambled to get some people to think about some questions a bit more. Okay. Um, just to wrap up, so when I presented to the retailers on Tuesday night, I said to them there's basically two main paths that I see of connecting. One is through the Bruce Munro sculptures, either through its design, from being inspired by design, or through the stories. But the second path is the tropical summer, which is where we've designed a whole range of window decals that you are basically being able to download and get printed and put on your window. And we're designing that, looking at some of the window spaces. There's components we'll give you individually, some designed together, some that can run along multiple shops all together. It's all designed with the in fashion colours that are coming out for 2019, so we've taken care of that. So that way then we don't get this mishmash of a tropical summer look with random pineapples. We've actually got a really chic, beautiful style looking um, pattern. So that's another really simple way to get involved. If you don't want to go down this path, take on the tropical summer look. Put in, go for that match funding we've got with Activate Darwin to create some really cool artistic and creative window displays that are really tropical. So also as a treat for you today, uh, I've been working with Mantra Pan Dennis and their kitchen staff. Uh, we have the tropical light drink, which as I've been, um, you may have heard me talk about. So two of the sculptures, uh, Water Towers and the Green Flash, are made up of these carbonated water bottles, which is basically soda water or sparkling mineral water. So the tropical light drink is soda water with tropical fruit. I'm also a huge advocate of arts and health, so creating low sugar versions. So when you've got soda water and tropical fruit, you do have a low sugar option. At the retailers night, Karen Sheldon Catering did our tropical light drink, which is a kakadu plum and dragon fruit spritzer. Again, iconic words for Darwin. 
And today we've got the Mantra Pantanas sending their version of the tropical light drink. So before we move in, I'm sure they'll bring it to us soon or it might be outside for you to have a taste of this tropical light. Uh, for anyone who has liquor licenses, the dirty version adds vodka. Again, a low sugar alcoholic version of the drink. So thank you. Um, please feel free to email me for more questions follow up. Definitely by tomorrow if you've got that Dropbox link, check back it in, download the full Dropbox again. You'll have all those hard resources plus the stories I mentioned today to be able to go forth and keep creating. But please feel free to drop me a line at that info at tropicallight.com.au if you have questions. Thank you very much. Um, and any questions again, these PowerPoints will be available on Dropbox. Thank you.